Hello, my name is Claire Fletcher and today I'm going to be sharing with you a little excerpt from my book Five Bush Weddings. Five Bush Weddings is a romantic comedy uh, and it's all about a wedding photographer named Stevie Jean who is in her early 30s and she specialises in country weddings in Queensland and New South Wales um, and as much as she loves capturing these love stories and she's really great at it, she has never really had a love story of her own. Um, and so the story picks up when she's feeling pretty dejected about sort of this career that she's fallen into as well as her love life. Um, and, you know, because she moves in these country communities, she sort of feels like she's met all the guys that there are to meet. Um, and so, yeah, we meet Stevie in action, um, shooting a wedding in the country. Uh, and I warn you, this is set where I grew up in regional Queensland and um, the opening scene draws on a tradition that I'm certainly very familiar with, but I've learned since publishing the book that it's, uh, it's pretty geographically specific. I think about one in two people in New South Wales recognise this tradition uh, and once it gets to Victorians and uh, South Australians and Western Australians, yeah. It's, uh, it's not something that they've heard of, so bear with me um, as I read you the beginning of Five Bush Weddings. Queensland, 2019. Six twangy notes of guitar were all it took for every man in a hundred metre radius to unbuckle his belt, drop his pants and do a dumb dance in his undies. Stevie Jean Harrison sighed and clipped the lens cap back on her camera. She'd shot enough country weddings to expect this response to the song Eagle Rock. And while she loved collecting colour from the dance floor, this was a sight that every Queenslander of a certain age already had burned into their memory. The happy couple's parents wouldn't be interested in seeing it immortalised in the wedding album. Under an endless inky sky crumbed with stars, the groom's brother and his best friend swayed in their boxes with their arms around each other, bow ties unclipped and collars loosened. Their eyes were closed in ecstasy as they sang along with Daddy Cool, a cigarette dangling from one's lip. At 31, Stevie had seen this scene play out at weddings and wakes, 18ths, 21sts and BNS bulls, since she was old enough, legally or not, to hold a stubby. But it still brought a smile to her face, the literal abandon of men, young and old, dancing a shuffling two-step, hobbled by the pants spilling over their boots. Stevie recognised a cousin of the bride racing away from the dance floor. Near the port she stopped to grasp her mother's shoulder, her face sunburned under a fascinator. Her eyes filled with tears as she inspected her feet in their strappy designer heels, now caked with red dirt like chocolate truffles. Not a local, then. I don't know what the hell is going on over there, she wailed, her fascinator pointing back at the dacked denizens of the dance floor. But I've got to get out of here and there's no phone service, let alone an Uber. Stifling a laugh, Stevie swung, swung her camera strap around her body and followed, maintaining her eye line strictly above the men's chests. In her summer work uniform of a long sleeveless black dress and blundstone boots, she was glad she'd pinned up her frizzy dark blonde hair. The sun had long set, but the heat of Queensland in late January lingered. There was barely a breath of breeze to stir the leaves of the eucalypts, or the strings of coloured light bulbs stretched above the high dance floor. The band were clambering back onto their stage, the back of a hessian draped flatbed truck parked on the bride's parents' property. Floodlights beamed down over the Lions Club run bar, where clusters of people were chatting and drinking. A few kids were still racing around hiding from their parents' attempts to put them down to sleep. And beyond the haloed lights was a darkness so thick you could almost touch it, alive with unseen creatures and swallowing paddocks and trees and channels and dams and tracks into one unfathomable expanse. Stevie looked down at the boots she'd polished before leaving Brisbane the previous afternoon. Now they were covered in dust after a long day's work. Stevie had been on location from the first bridesmaid's blow-dry and ill-advised early rounds of Prosecco. She'd slunk around the cottage while the women were made up, captured the delivery of bouquets, the arrival of wedding cars, and caught the father of the bride's first look at his daughter, which had everyone welling up. She'd shot the ceremony from dearly beloved to the last handful of confetti, and deployed her bawdiest jokes to keep the bridal party smiling through a series of poses. 
Then it was back to the reception, with barely time to snatch a canopy before she had to work through dozens of configurations of family photos. Then race off into the paddock for kissy portraits of the newlyweds as the sun set. As the guests filed into the marquee and sank into hired chairs for a three-course meal, Stevie had no such respite. She shot the speeches, the cake cutting, the couple's first dance. Most other wedding photographers she knew ducked out after the first dance, but Stevie stayed to capture the raucous scenes from later on in the night. It was something she'd started doing when she was learning the ropes. Often she was shooting for friends and dancing around with her camera in one hand and a drink in the other, a tangled, glorious mess of business and pleasure. She had caught some hilarious moments over the years and now her clients expected it. Having photographed more than a hundred weddings, Stevie barely had to think about her checklist of images anymore. She was pretty sure that she had it all, which was lucky given the flasks of Bundy rum now being passed around with increasing frequency. The Eagle Rock moment usually heralded a turning point of sorts, after which her camera lens was less welcome, but she'd do one last sweep. She ducked under the marquee where empty wine glasses littered the long dining tables. The candles had burned down, wax pooling amid scattered gum leaves and forgotten place cards, and Stevie clocked a quiet moment that made her lift her camera an inch silently closer, like a nature documentarian who'd spotted a big cat. Red, the burly groom, was trying to feed his famished tipsy wife a piece of wedding cake. It was a classic old school fruit cake rendered with a sturdy facade of fondant, a sign that this family was ruled by a powerful matriarch with a love of tradition and an iron fist. And Janelle was not interested. Stevie knew this was their first moment alone as a married couple. She also knew that Janelle's untouched plates had been cleared while she'd been circulating among the guests, drowning bubbly. She was now perched on Red's lap, a generally capable and no-nonsense woman reduced to a giggling heap of tulle skirts. As Red tenderly nudged a forkful of cake between Janelle's teeth mid-laugh, Stevie snapped a frame that said more about their relationship than any of the shots they'd posed for earlier. Satisfied, Stevie made two milky cups of tea, grabbed a piece of wedding cake and pulled up a chair next to the bride's great aunt Mabel. Mabel had proven herself an ally earlier in the day when she deftly helped Stevie avoid a family faux pas while setting up the group portraits. But Stevie had recognised Mabel's role as the family fixer as soon as they arrived at the church. Mabel was the sort of woman who carried an arsenal of floral hankies to hand out at the first sign of a sniffle. She'd headed off renegade relatives as they entered the church and guided them toward neutral pews with a kind but firm hand. At the reception, she had stocked the ladies' bathroom with baskets of tissues, deodorant, hairspray and perfume. She made sure the waitresses knew that Red's grandma needed a tender piece of meat and to take their time topping up Uncle Tony's drink. She knew everyone's business. There was something familiar about her. And Stevie wasn't sure if they'd met before or if she was just such a staunch archetype of a bushwoman of a certain age. Oh, thanks for the tea, love, Mabel said. She was ensconced in a plastic chair, a hefty woman stuffed into a taut jacket skirt suit like an upholstered front rower. From the set of her curls, it seemed she was single-handedly keeping Elnet in business. You've been working hard today. Have you been a photographer for long then? You know, I just realized this week it's been five years since the first wedding I shot, Stevie said, blowing on her tea. It was always meant to be a temporary thing before the next proper job. I dipped a toe in with a few friends' weddings and here I am, still doing it years later. Mabel patted Stevie's arm. You seem like a natural. I don't have much of an arty eye, but I can see the way you see people. And you have a knack for spotting the little moments that mean a lot. And you're one of us. You know the land, you're not some city blow-in who'll flinch at a bit of red dust on the wedding dress and cry over a dead kangaroo on the side of the road. Stevie laughed. I guess it's one of the few times being a hopeless romantic comes in handy. Hopeless, hey? Mabel echoed, her voice rising with intrigue. Do you have a partner? Mabel, you might think you know about drought in this district, but I haven't had a boyfriend in six years. Well, in the year of our Lord 2019, I worry for the men of this country if you can't get a date with an ass like that. Stevie wasn't sure she'd heard that right. I promised myself after that breakup I'd hold out for a grand, glorious, perfect love story, she added dryly. 
still waiting. Mabel set down her cake fork and Stevie, anticipating a lecture about being picky, prickled. I've put myself out there, I've dolled myself up, I've tried everyone's advice and met all the nephews and friends they wanted to set me up with. I swear, I've met every eligible bachelor on the eastern seaboard. When you're single at a certain age, everyone thinks it's because there's something wrong with you. So much of it is just luck. Stevie stabbed and <laughs> Stevie jabbed at a slab of fruitcake with her fork. Maybe it's time to give up on the big love story and just embrace spinsterhood. Mabel huffed. Why is spinster such a dirty word when bachelor is practically a compliment? You're preaching to the choir, darling. In that moment, Stevie felt the weight of all she'd done since 5am pressing down on her. Not to mention all the all-nighters and dud dates and solo Sunday nights she'd endured for years. I think maybe I've been waiting for my real life to start once I found the person I'd spend it with. And he's not coming. It's time to back myself. You could do a lot worse, Mabel said gently. And not just in a you'll meet the love of your life when you least expect it way. Be the love of your own life. If you're still treating this job, which you're obviously great at, like a temporary gig, maybe that's a good place to start. So that's Five Bush Weddings, a little bit from chapter one. Um, and I'm actually about to release a follow-up sort of spin-off to that story um, with some of the background characters in Five Bush Weddings taking centre stage, including Mabel, who you just met. Uh, so my new book is called Love Match, and it's out on the 29th of August. Thanks for listening, um, and I hope you enjoyed these stories.